Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Pleased to have an intern with us. Um, she, uh, she was an intern down at the SBC lab. Um, and uh, she's uh, and she's done some beautiful work down there, and now actually she's doing some really nice work up here with us too. So I wish we could keep Nicole for the whole year, but I think we can't. <laughs> anyway, it's a pleasure to have her, and she's going to be speaking about uncovering semantic similarity between query terms. Thank you, Jennifer. Can everyone hear me? Okay, so I'm going to be talking about uncovering semantic similarity between query terms. Um, this is joint work with Steve Chen that I did when I was at the Microsoft Research Lab down in Silicon Valley. Uh, I was an intern there, and um, at other times I'm a fourth-year PhD student at MIT. Uh, so the MSN search bulk keep track of all of the query terms that are submitted to them, and they log these query terms. They keep a lot of data around. They keep around the IP address where the query term was sent from, a timestamp of the query term, and the bag of words that can, uh, the query term consisted of. Um, and so these searches, these query terms, there are about 8 million distinct terms or bags of words per month, uh, and about 800,000 terms per day. This data is from February and March of 2004. This is all of the data that we have currently. Uh, we're working on getting some more data. But uh, these terms are, these figures are probably growing and might be much larger now. Uh, so these terms are um, generated by humans. So we have this human generated stream of words and phrases. And that's uh, very interesting concept because these humans, they're searching for terms because they want to learn some information about them. So you might hope that the uh, terms that they're, that you can see some pattern of behavior in the terms that the people are searching for. In particular, you might be able to answer questions about what terms are semantically related to each other. And you could hope to do this because you know that, uh, say, if the search is for um, two particular terms appear a lot together in time, then they probably have meanings, related meanings. Uh, so the main focus of this work is to define some measure of similarity between terms, and then we want to try and develop an efficient way to evaluate this measure of similarity. So before I get into the main focus of my talk, I want to show you a little bit about the MSN search data and what people are actually looking for, what, what these things look like. Uh, as I said, a query is a bag of words. That means it's whatever somebody types into the search bar in MSN search or into the address bar. And then, as you know, MSN search will call a search on something you type into the address bar if it's not a URL. So these can be proper nouns like Google or addresses like google.com. We see IP addresses. We see multi-word queries like Janet Jackson, and apparently people are even <laughs> searching for their wives online. <laughs> uh, so it, there's also, I mean, I only have up to two word queries here, but queries can be much longer, and um, we've seen up to 40 word queries. Uh, so on March 6th of 2004, this is just uh, some Saturday in March. These were the top queries. You'll see that Google, uh, main competitor, is the top queried item on MSN search. And the second top queried item on MSN search is Yahoo, another competitor. <laughs> Apparently, at least, yeah, at least MSN search. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, if you type something into the address bar, it will route, it, it will run a search for you. But then it's. I 
I don't know. Like when I'm looking for a map quest, I often type map quest in and then press enter and then yeah, to go to the link. Yeah. Well, it, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, these numbers are so high that I have trouble believing that this is just a mistake, a user mistake. I think they intend to search for Google uh, in, through MSN search. Uh, so there's, I think there were 21 million queries on, uh, like, there were only, um, you know, about 500,000 distinct query terms on March 6th, but there were a total of 21 million queries on March 6th. So you can see that. Either that you can tell based on the form code in the search logs, but I don't have that information here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the first informational query is sex, followed closely by games. Uh, this is slightly an artifact of the fact uh, because this is a weekend. This is a Saturday. Sex and games are very popular on the weekend. <laughs> in the uh, weekdays, the top most popular query that uh, is informational was weather. And that was also 11th. Here, sex is the 11th most popular query. Uh, on the weekdays, sex was the 45th most popular query. And weather on the weekends was the 21st mo most popular query. Um, so. Another thing you'll notice about this data is that the frequencies seem to be dropping quite rapidly as you go from the most frequent item to the next most frequent item to the next most frequent item. Uh, you might predict that it follows some very nice distribution, like the power law. And in fact, you'd be right. This is a log log plot of the frequencies. The blue dots are the uh, actual data, and the red dot is the best fit curve. Um, it's actually 0.8. So, yeah. 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 No, we have 21 million queries. How do you get that number long? It goes and what? It's like. Uh, the constant is something, so the, it's, let's see. It's not the It's base E, first of all. Uh, but anyway, the point is that it, it follows a nice predictable distribution. And it seems to be funny. Yeah. Uh, so all of this data, you can play around with it yourself. There's an internal website, Search BI, that's a lot of fun to go look at. You can find the uh, top searched queries um, in this, for any day that you like, the top thousand search uh, queries, and look at the data yourself. Um, so now I want to get back to the main focus of my talk. That, that was uh, what the data we have. That's the data we have available to us. Now, we want to define a measure of similarity between search terms and try and uncover uh, two terms that might be similar for reasons that will become clear later. So uh, the idea we had was that if queries have a similar temporal behavior, then they are probably related. So uh, for example, Janet Jackson and the Super Bowl both spiked, had a very large spike in March. And some of you might remember why. Uh, so in fact, they, these events were codependent in some sense. Um, now let's formalize this a little bit. In particular, if we have, uh, we, we will define a frequency vector for each query. So the frequency vector takes on day i the number of appearances of query q divided by the total number of searches that were, occurred on that day. And that's the ith coordinate of query Q's frequency vector. So we're discretizing the frequency vector here. And we're doing it per day in, in this talk. Um, now, the, we'll define the similarity between two queries P and Q to be the statistical correlation between their frequency functions. 
uh, statistical correlation is defined as I've written it up here. It's a standard measure. Uh, you'll notice that the statistical correlation of a random variable with itself is one. This number will never be less than minus one, so it's always between minus one and one. And two independent random variables have correlation of zero. So this is what you would expect from, uh, the, the correlation does indeed measure how well things move together. Okay, so let's see now why correlation seems promising. Uh, what I've drawn here is the frequency function for the query Valentine's Day and the query Cupid during the period of February and March 2004. You'll see that both of these queries spike, I guess, predictably at February 14th. Um, there's a lot more background noise for Cupid than for Valentine's Day, but you still have, they have a very high correlation because they both spike together. So their correlation is 0 0.97. As I said, correlation is always, always between minus one and one, so 0 0.97 is a rather high correlation. Uh, so let's look at some other examples. This is Disney and Cartoon Network. They are weekend queries. These big spikes are the weekends in February and March. So these are separate queries or they're yeah. the same? Uh, these are separate queries, but these are their frequency functions, and I'm showing you that at the same time that people are searching for Disney, other people are searching for Cartoon Network. Yeah? If you look up church, the same If I look up what? Church. Church? <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, a lot of the weekend queries, I don't know about church, but um, there are other typical weekend queries, and they all have spikes. Yeah. So sex and Disney with <laughs> In fact, they do have a high correlation. Um, we, we have some ideas about how to refine that so that you don't start, you know, when you search for Disney MSN search, so you might also be interested in <laughs> porn. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so there is, has been work on uh, trying to study query refinement. That's a different thing. That's the idea of trying to see how people refine their queries to become more specific about what they were actually looking for. And then you would want to look at a user session to see how their query is evolving over time. But what we're looking at here is relations between terms. So it's not necessarily true that the person who was searching for Disney also searched for Cartoon Network, but rather that they seem to be of interest at the same moments in time, and therefore we hope that they are semantically related. You could consider combining that with other techniques of uh, uncovering the semantic relation between terms. But right now, your level of terminology is big. Are you going to change it? Is it fixed, or you can change it like that? Yeah, we, we, have, uh, we hope to change it. Right now, it's, uh, that's how our data is presented to us. But MSN search does have the ability to give us data like, with timestamps as opposed to counts per day. And we're working on getting that information. Uh, so one more example quickly. This is the banks. Uh, these are uh, banks are a typical weekday query. So you see the big troughs here are the weekends. And I find it interesting that most people pay their bills on Monday or Friday. And that's why there's these spikes on Monday and Friday in these banks. Uh, so Bank of America and Wells Fargo had a correlation of 0 0.98, and therefore we're able to automatically discover that these two are the same thing without doing any text analysis. Okay, so that was a brief overview of the types of results that we're looking for and that we might hope to get. Hopefully you're now convinced that correlation is something interesting to try and measure, so now I'm going to discuss how to measure it. I <laughs> okay, yeah, so, well, just, just looking at these two plots, you can see that, you can see that, for example, Disney and Bank of America probably have a negative correlation. Yeah, but um, in fact, at the, at, towards the end of the talk, I'll be showing you clusters of that are the grouping that we get, the top correlated terms with different query terms. And I have a file on this computer if you want to ask me afterwards about anything in particular, see what types of results we're getting. They're not all good. We need to work on how to 
uh, sift through the results. Yeah? Can you look at green? It might be that the same people that are playing their fields for Bank of America, they're also playing the, their fields at both parts. So if, if you look at sequences of queries, the distributions of queries that follow or precede a query are really nice, are very related. So that's like you're talking about per IP address. Like in the long tail, the top ones are very nice. They get this very nice related stuff that people are looking in sequence. So I'm thinking here it might be that you're just seeing the effect of these sequences from the same wizard. Because every single thing like Disney and Cartoon Network, it, they might come from exactly the same users in the weekend. Or these guys are paying their bills at both banks. Yeah, uh, we were hoping that we would find information that you don't find by looking at uh, just fixed, IP, you know, just users with the same IP address. Of course, this um, technique can be applied to answer those types of questions as well. If instead of taking a day as a each coordinate of your frequency vector as a day, you could take each coordinate of your frequency vector being an IP address or something like this. But the thing is that you might hope that, I, I mean, I don't think that many people, at least I don't have two different bank accounts. Maybe, <laughs> maybe most people do. But you can hope that you can uncover things that you don't see just by looking at one user. Yeah? All the things that are essentially correlated with the day of the week. Yeah. How do you remove that? Because I don't need any people to do the Monday and Monday. All right. So uh, certainly weekday queries are all fairly well correlated with each other, but um, we seem to be able to sift through different weekday queries. So the banks here are well correlated with each other and not so well correlated with Monster was an example I have in mind. So Monster is a job search site, and the correlation of Monster and Bank of America is 0.83. And our cutoff for query significance, we decided, was 0.9. Of course, you can play with the cutoff a bit, but the point is that the banks are much better correlated with each other than they are with other weekday queries. And that's probably because of these effects of like Monday, Friday, and that it rises a bit during the week, and these other things that you, I mean, during the month, or at the end of the month, has higher. Yeah? If you look at, I don't know, well, it seems like anomaly similarities more interesting. There's a million ways of getting to figure out Bank of America and Wells Fargo thing. But what's interesting is, if something happens, if something happens to that rack you know, all this information, who cares if they're all here every Monday to go through Saddam Hussein and George Bush, but a thing happens, people create all these different queries, and another thing happens in Iraq, and create different things. So you look at other measures that maybe are more... Uh, so what, what you're talking about is more like this type of query, things that tend yeah. to spike together. Our techniques are actually quite good at this type of thing because they're not fooled about periodic, uh, things that have the same periodicity. So... Uh, Um, so we, we do we can find stuff like that. Uh, okay, so how do we actually compute this measure? Well, first of all, the problem that we're trying to answer is, you know, somebody comes to MSN search, they type in a search term, and we want to suggest to them other searches that they might be interested in performing. Or an advertiser comes to bid on some keywords in an ad auction, and the soon to be MSN ad auctions. And we might want to suggest to this advertiser other keywords that he might be interested in bidding on. So he says, I'm interested in Valentine's Day. You say, maybe you're also interested in Cupid. Uh, so the problem is that we want to find all queries that have a high correlation with some input query Q. Uh, the brute force approach to this problem takes, of course, order dn space, where n is the number of queries, and d is the number of time units in your discretization. Uh, for one year, well, at least in the two months that we have, we, we already have 14 million queries. So in one year, there's n is at least 14 million. And the number of days is 365. If you want to make smaller time units, the number of hours in a year is something like 8,000. So if you want to store 8,000 times 14 million integers, you're going to need, if you do the calculation, 500 gigabytes of data. And this is a bit too much. It's, and an expensive use of the resources. So the goal of our work was to approximate the correlation and reduce the 
uh, amount of storage space necessary. Yes? Uh, <laughs> well, at least our approach will be more scalable. <laughs> Okay, yeah, so these are the number of queries that occurred at least 10 times in a given day. And um, our query, uh, the data that we receive already cuts off at three. So they don't tell us about queries that appear just once or twice. <clears throat> so uh, we want to discuss how we can try to approximate the correlation and use much less uh, storage space. Recall that the correlation is this function I've written up here. Uh, well, if you'll notice, this is simply, I, I've removed now the scalar uh, multiple of 1 over n. This correlation is simply the dot product of the scaled normalized frequency vectors of the input queries p and q. So what we want to approximate is the dot product between two vectors, or uh, equivalently the cosine of the angle between these two vectors. And uh, the approach we'll take is to embed the frequency vectors into a low-dimensional space in a way that we don't distort the dot products very much. So we want to define a mapping V, which takes any vector X and maps it to a vector V of X, such that the dot product in the original space is approximately the dot product in the new space. And the dimension of the original space is delta. I mean, the dimension of the original space, D, is uh, larger than the dimension of the new space delta, so we can reduce the dimension a lot. And then we would need just order delta n time and space to compute these high correlation pairs. But you have to read the data once at least. And what that, what that uh, so if we design an algorithm that doesn't... We don't want to read all, all the data. I don't want to store all the data at any particular moment. I, I will read all the data. but. Uh, it just all, I'm not, the time here is query complexity of the data structure, not time to compute the data structure. Okay, so the uh, technique we'll use is a standard technique in um, low distortion embeddings, and uh, it was also used in the max cut algorithm of Gomans and Williamson in order to uh, round the SDP, the semi definite program that they came up with for the max cut problem. It's a hyperplane embedding, so you have two vectors that are at an angle theta from each other, and you want to estimate this angle theta. So what you can do is you can drop a random hyperplane onto, into your space, and you look at the probability that this hyperplane splits the vectors x and y. So you just record on which side of the hyperplane does the vector x appear, and this picture is on the positive side of the hyperplane or the top side, and which side of the hyperplane does the vector y appear? Now, the probability that this hyperplane uh, has the x and y fall on the same side of this hyperplane is something like 1 minus, or it's exactly 1 minus theta over pi. Well, this probability is independent of the original dimension d, and therefore we can get a good estimate of theta using the Chernoff bound uh, by dropping enough random hyperplanes. And this number of hyperplanes that we need to drop is independent of the original dimension d. It just depends on the accuracy we want the estimator to have. So this is, suggests the following algorithm. We're going to choose delta random hyperplanes. And then we're going to take each query q and look at its scaled normalized frequency vector. And we perform this mapping for each query q. So we in the ith coordinate of the uh, v of q, x sub q, we're going to record whether the vector x sub q fell on the top or the bottom of the ith random hyperplane. This is going to give us a vector in delta dimensional space. Each component of the vector is minus 1 or plus 1. Finally, once we have this information, we can uh, approximate the angle between any two input queries p and q because we know that the probability that they have the same coordinate in the ith position is precisely proportional to the angle between them. So that allows us to estimate the uh, angle between P and Q, 
given all these hyperplanes and their coordinates. And then we can estimate the correlation because the correlation is exactly the cosine of the angle between the two factors. Okay, so uh, getting back to a means point, this algorithm, well, first of all, this is an unbiased estimator in the sense that the, uh, what we're estimating is the correlation. The expectation of that estimate is exactly the real correlation, and it has low variance. And it can be computed without storing all dn integers of the counts of the queries on each day. And this is because the coordinates of the points are being revealed to us in an online sense, one by one. And as a point coordinate is revealed to us, we can generate a random integer for the next uh, coordinate of our random hyperplanes, multiply that times the current coordinate of the query vector, and then add it to a sum that we keep around. So we just need to keep around little delta and sums, as opposed to dn integers. So as we're computing this, we just need delta n integers, which is about five megabytes. And furthermore, once we finish the time unit that, you know, time interval that we're interested in, say these two months, we can, we just need to know the sign of all of these dot products. And therefore, we just need to keep around delta n bits as opposed to delta n integers. So that's just 175 megabytes. I don't need that terabyte drive that MSN search will buy me. Um, so this is the hyperplane embedding. Now we have a very uh, you know, low storage data structure. But when we want to query this data structure, and I want to find all queries with high correlation with an input query Q, I still need to uh, search through a linear number of data points to you know, search through all the data points and save the top ones. So can I reduce the query complexity of a data structure, reduce its dependence on n? And the standard approach for that is locality-sensitive hashing. Uh, locality-sensitive hash function is a function that collides. You have some metric space, and you want to um, hash the points in this metric space such that near points collide with high probability, and far co points collide with low probability. Uh, this has been used a lot in practice. One place you might have seen it is the shingles algorithm of Broder et al. This algorithm is designed to uh, you know, tell when two web pages are a near copy of each other so that MSN doesn't have to report duplicates in its search results. Uh, once you have these locality-sensitive hash functions, you can build a data structure that uses superlinear space but sublinear time to find uh, approximate nearest neighbors. So uh, this guarantees, the type of guarantees you get is if you have a neighbor that is near to you, I will return an, to you a neighbor that is not far from you. And the superlinear and sublinear in this statement depend on the parameters you want in terms of near and far and the probabilities you have in terms of high and low in the previous bullet. And particular with our parameters that we've determined this, you know, cutoff for near, this definition of near should be like 0.9 correlation. So with our parameters, the standard uh, locality sensitive hash function for the Hamming distance in uh, binary space it takes order delta n plus n to the five thirds space and order n to the two thirds query complexity. So this is nice in that it's sublinear query complexity in n, but the uh, space is too large for our taste at least. Um, so what can we do about that? We're going to take just a more, a more simplistic approach, which we call the k-bit filter approach. It's very simple. You just look at the first k bits of those delta bits that you had, and you hash the queries into buckets based on these first k bits. Now, you want to reduce the number of queries that you're searching to try and find the high correlation ones. So instead of searching all the queries, you're going to just search the queries who agree with your uh, first, your input query in the, uh, at least 0.85 fraction of the first k bits. Thus, you have um, just that many buckets that you need to search through. And when k equals 20, which is what we took in our experiments, you have just uh, 1,500 buckets to look through. 
you're not losing much because if two queries are highly correlated, they probably agree in, very, in a lot of bits. So the probability that they agree in uh, at least 0.85 places in the first k places is quite high. Um, and you, so you're going to see a constant fraction of the high probability queries. However, it, you aren't going to be able to get any sort of theoretical guarantee here without assuming something about the distribution of correlations in your input set because you can construct an example where everything is just below your threshold in its correlation with your input query and then the, these buckets that you're searching through will contain all the queries in the data set. Um, but in practice, uh, we're doing pretty well. In expectation, um, we have a million buckets and 14 million queries, so each bucket contains 14 queries. And when we're searching through 1,500 buckets, we expect to search through something like 21,000 queries. Uh, for Valentine's Day, the first query I showed you, we just had to look through 7,500 queries. Disney was 14,000, and Bank of America was 40,000. So even in Bank of America, we have a savings of 500 a speed up of 500. Okay, so now I'm going to get back to the data. Uh, I'll show you the types of um, results we're getting from this technique. So first, these are some results that I'm happy with. The green ones are the ones I found particularly amusing. We have, uh, in Valentine's Day, people seem to be searching a lot for Cupid, chocolate-covered strawberries, and there are even people that search for romantic ideas on Valentine's Day. <laughs> Um, can I interrupt you? Yeah. Actually, those things are coming into sequence with this. I mean, I can check this. And romantic ideas is coming a lot after Valentine's Day. So you think so that this is a... Type Valentine's Day, they type romantic ideas after that. So, and the thing with Cupid are things like this. So, so you're saying so it's the same people the same ideas. It's the same people in many cases. Okay. So it's a very expensive way to find what a person is doing. <laughs> just, I, I tried all your queries, and actually every single thing you have heard, you have high correlations with gaming in C, start to never it's not, but I'm just saying it might mm -hmm. be cheaper just to get that. Well, you, you really think, for example, that Bank of America, that somebody put the yeah, Bank of America, and Bank of America was well, part of it, it's the next most, is the most frequent query that follows idea. Bank of America. In MSN. In MSN. Sure. It doesn't think this is not good at all. I'm just saying this is not good at all. Also, uh, what time frame are you, do you do this over? Um, Okay, the probability that query can be That's interesting. Well, why then? But then, you the follows Can you tell me if sex follows Disney? <laughs> Uh, in, yeah, in, in these clusters, I'm, I'm removing the uh, both ur urals and pornography. So we do actually uh, interspersed in here. You might see uh, urals, and in this cluster, you do see pornography. Um, so Disney, these are the things that our technique found. The ones in white seem to me to be quite related to Disney. Uh, there are all these, you know, animated, in my opinion, slightly annoying little dancing creatures and stuff. Uh, then and the ones in red are a little bit less related to Disney, but we still are seeing them. So things like media player, games, you can imagine that people that are interested in Disney are also interested in playing Age of Mythology. Perhaps Cheat Planet is those cheat codes for um, Xbox games, I think. Uh, and for Bank of America, this, these are the top correlations that we get. So we see Wells Fargo. Uh, the, the, all of the first five or four or five are banks. 
And we also see some telecom industry stuff, which is, it's, I think it's a wireless cell phone network provider or something of this nature. Um, so these clusters were fairly clean clusters. We have some not so clean clusters. For yellow pages, uh, we get, well, the first one, and, or the first two you might maybe are related to yellow pages, but then the CNN Financial Network, we also see uh, Dow Jones, Charles Schwab, Accurant, a lot of financial stuff as well correlated with yellow pages. And yellow pages is a very popular query. So um, these, these correlations are all between 0.98 and 0.99, and this is computed exactly uh, uh, using our technique. So are these the things that are most highly correlated with yellow pages? Yeah. Removing urls. Uh, this is Macy's department store. Uh, yeah, I have no idea <laughs> any like logical reason why Macy's department store and the INS have anything to do with each other, except that during February the uh, frequency function for Macy's looks something like this, where it drops at February 14th, and that something happened in the INS. I don't know if you know what. <laughs> 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 but there was something about INS in the news. Yeah, so uh, on the next slide, I'll, I'll just say some things that we're trying to do to improve these results, and one of them is going to be to uh, reduce that granularity. Um, let me just, uh, so eBay, another a very popular query has these things. These are the top correlations with eBay. And actually, I've by now forgotten what crutch field is, but I don't see. Well, that makes some sense that you might want to like buy some, some kind of electronics through crutch field, or you might want to buy it from eBay. I mean, I mean that would just. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Yahoo Personals is a. <laughs> I don't know what you want to buy in eBay. <laughs> um, Yeah, so, so um, we do seem to, like popular queries do do poorly. Google is not well correlated with anything, which, I mean, that's kind of relief. At least it's not correlated with something unrelated to it. Uh, Yellow Pages and eBay are very, are like within the top 20, or top 50 at least, and their clusters that don't look so nice. So it might be something to do with that. Also, uh, we, we were hoping that we could try and improve the clusters, and then maybe the popular queries will start looking better. So ways we can improve the results, um, how, how can we filter out these things that we didn't like so much in the clusters? Um, first of all, we're only looking at two months. So if we were able to extend the time window to a year, say, you would hope that uh, the fact that you know something happens to INS in February and to Macy's in February isn't going to have that much of an effect anymore. When you say improved results, what do you mean? Do you have a, do you have a test set on How are you evaluating it? Uh, it's just. Do you have a test set for that? Uh, what do you mean test set for that? When you say improving results, what does that mean? These, you... these are ways that I, I. We're just evaluating the clusters by our own intuition. Uh, if we wanted to go further with this, we could do user studies or something like that. But we want to uh, find a way to automate the, uh, these clusters such that the clusters that you get are, are good to a user without having to sift through it manually and delete the things that you don't like. Yeah? Did you look to see if um, some of the bad results are due to these efficiency things that you did? Or oh, yeah, so the bad results, we computed it exactly these correlations when we turned it everything exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the time period. Obviously, you should play with it and find the, an optimal length for the time period. And furthermore, we imagine that it could be useful to do some kind of discounting factor. So you can just have a, an infinite time period, but you have an exponential decay of the days as you go along. So the someday really far in the past isn't very important. 
Uh, yeah, we were taking relative. Yeah, uh, well, the, yeah, I guess not. But the reason we did relative was actually to normalize for the weekends because the searches on the weekends are so small that if we didn't do relative, we were afraid everything would be correlated just because they're not searched for much on the weekends. Right, so uh, another thing, as someone mentioned, we can reduce the granularity. So right now we're looking at one day because that's the way the data was presented to us. But uh, you can imagine that the distinction between morning and evening should definitely be important. Of course, as we get uh, finer and finer granularity, we might start being worried about time zone effects. Um, I don't know. We'll, we'll see once we start running this data. And finally, we can consider returning results only for a subset of the queries. It's not quite clear to me which queries are doing well yet. So uh, certainly spiking queries do well. Valentine's Day and Cupid or Super Bowl and Janet Jackson. Um, but we, we need to look a little bit more into that. Uh, finally, there's some things that we, some grander goals that we still have in mind. Uh, first issue is robustness. So um, correlation, in fact, is very sensitive to outliers. If you have two functions that are really well correlated, like even exactly have correlation of one, and then you set one coordinate of one of the functions really high, the correlation is thrown way off. Um, so it would be nice if you could define a more robust measure and find ways to approximate this. Uh, furthermore, if you could do something a bit closer to a streaming model or prove some lower bounds here, this, I think, is a nice theoretical problem. So the idea is that the number of pairs with high correlation might be significantly less than the number of queries. And what you want to do is design an algorithm that uses space proportional to the size of the output and is sublinear in the, uh, the number of items, distinct items in the data set. Um, finally, there are lots of other statistics that could be very interesting to compute on query streams. You can see some of these in the Zugel Zeitgeist uh, statistics. If you haven't looked at them, they're quite fun to peruse through. Uh, one statistic that I think you should be able to either prove or find an impossibility result for is the top declining queries. So you want a one-pass algorithm that uh, looks at a data stream coming in, and it's trying to see which uh, query term lost the most number of queries, say, you can ask in terms of some, uh, you know, normalizing out for some sort of mean or something like that. Uh, so, and this is asking the question of what fads are disappearing. Um, okay, and that's all I have. In the query complexity of the data structure? Um, well, we can pre compute some answers, first of all. And actually, you might benefit by just pre computing all the answers because there aren't really that many highly correlated pairs. And also, uh, it's for, it depends on your application. If you're doing it for a keyword suggestion or something, I think it's fast enough. As it is. Yeah? Uh, you used the term significantly before. And I can't hear you misusing the term. You've been using or misusing the term R for 100 years now. And you're using not that statistic. Of what? You said point nine. you your cut off those significant. You can look at what 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 stuff you think you can do better than you use it properly. So if you would tell them it's wrong, you could do it anyway. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 